Thanks, Mel. Thank you. Thanks, Mark. It's a, it's a huge pleasure to be here, and thank you all for, for coming out today. I understand there's other entertainment down the hallway that might be, might be uh, equally or significantly more engaging. I'm not sure, but it's kind of you to be here. And I know that Austin, because I've, I first came here 28 years ago, visited frequently, I know that it's always exactly this lovely, especially in July <laughs> and August. It was kind of you to have this kind of weather waiting for me, uh, and it's just great to be here. This is, a, this is just a terrific institution, and I love walking around the campus. It just, it just sort of warms my heart. It's, it's a pretty great, great place in so many ways. So thanks for having me, and I'll do my best. I'm going to tip my way along up here because I'm dependent upon my podiums, and as you can see, I'm going to be rocking back and forth at it. I'll see what I can do. What I wanted to do today is to, uh, is to talk about a problem that developed for me, a big problem, starting about 10 years ago. Maybe it was 12 years ago. Uh, and it was, it was a problem that uh, I engaged by reading and thinking hard about the 1970s and realizing that, uh, that, the Im that the version of the 1970s that was widely popular and available either in classrooms or in popular history books or in uh, popular cultural memory was a version that didn't completely resonate with my own experiences. And so here's the confession that, as you can tell by the color of my beard, I'm plenty old enough to remember the 1970s rather well. And so what, what I, the, the problem emerged in the following way. And like a typical historian or academic, I sort of identify this problem. And then I've got to you know, sink my teeth into it and wrestle with it and spend the next decade trying to resolve it and come to some, some understanding of the problem. So what I, what I what I was struck by was the American images of the 1970s that we have today with us, which are essentially images of failure, uh, images of, of confusion and images of drift in a lot of different regards across a lot of different vectors and, and, and elements. So if I, depending on my technological ability, let's just start with the good stuff, and that is the sort of sense of cultural failure that, that, that emerged across the 1970s, aesthetic failure. In this case, uh, disco music, which, and again, I know I'll offend various people, and that's part of what I do, because whenever you make judgments about things, some people love disco, and I'm sorry, it's great dancing music, whatever, but anyway. <laughs> for an awful lot of people at the time, it was horrifying, and for a lot of people afterwards, it was befuddling, like weird, like where did this come from? How did it survive? Why can they still bring it up online? So I'm sorry. Here it is. The, 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 another example would be the, uh, the world of, yes, the aesthetics of carpets. Okay. It's, it's like shooting fish in a barrel. I mean, it's really, it's a little unfair of me, right, to pull up 1970s popular culture because, you know, how can you, how can you go right, right? Because you can't. Everything goes wrong. It's so orange shag carpets. Um, other examples of this would be, would be some of the nice um, facial hair tendencies of the the sideburns, and if you haven't seen Newt Gingrich like this when he was in the geography department, a little state college in Georgia, it's kind of nice. You get a it's charming. This is Leonard Nimoy, of course, from from Star Trek. These this sort of sideburn thing. Um, you could get similarly the wide ties. I couldn't get a great image, but there's a nice one, especially especially because of the colors involved. The shades involved seem to be. Again, I know I'm going to step on people's toes because somebody loves light green in here, and so I'm sorry. But there was a terrific emphasis on peculiar shades of, of green and orange in this, in this generation. Also, the, um, the, the business of polyester pantsuits. These are, these are some of my real favorite images that come to mind uh, that were taken seriously aesthetically at the time. So were the, some of the, uh, the, the footwear involved. Uh, Elton John maybe was one of the most famous purveyors of this sort of, uh, you know, sort of elevated footwear, um, the whole business of platform shoes. And of course, the real key to cultural confusion and drift in the 1970s can be articulated right here by the very fact that people were purchasing pet rocks uh, and, and, and taking care of them, comforting them as their pets. So this is a rather bizarre business, the culture of the 1970s. But the book is not just about culture. There's a little culture in here because we all swim in culture. All decision making happens within a cultural context. There's no way to separate yourself from it, so we have to be engaged with it. But it's much more than that, this, this set of images that we carry with us of the 1970s today about failure. So the, other, the next uh, element of this would be the military elements. And here I'm thinking the images of the, that come to mind uh, of sort of strategic as well as military, military failure have to do with drawing, with withdrawing in defeat from the war in Southeast Asia, from the war in Vietnam. And here we're looking at the embassy at Saigon, the building right next to it, where they were, where various uh, non-communist and anti-communist uh, Vietnamese were trying to get out uh, in April 28th and 29th of 1975, um, before the final success of the communist effort to reunify the country, which was successful, of course, on April 30th. Um, 
And this, this sort of failure uh, is also, I suppose, captured maybe most notably by this shot of the, the helicopter, that's what people tend to remember, is the business of getting on the helicopter and then fighting, trying to fight your way on or off, I mean, with the sense that one's entire future, which of course it could be in the case of, of anti-communist Vietnamese, uh, the potential for being left behind was a particularly traumatic prospect. And it was similarly traumatic for the Americans trying to decide who could flee and who could not flee. All of this symbolized a kind of military and strategic failure. Uh, you could see this as well in terms of the politi politics of the 1970s. Uh, the political failures of this era were at the very top. Uh, inherited from Lyndon Johnson. Oh, no, I put this up without thinking I was going to be in the LBJ school. I'm sorry, let me get out of that. Uh, that didn't happen. There was, no, there was no failure by the Johnson administration. But there was, actually, let, let me go back because I, I shouldn't make fun of this. What, what I love here is that contrast of, of John, Johnson's sort of optimism, positive, sort of problem solving, which Lyndon Johnson was extraordinary at, versus the sort of crushing burden that you get, the sense of him weighing upon him um, later in his administration as the Vietnam War uh, goes south for the American side. Uh, you have three failed presidencies across the 1970s, uh, that of Richard Dixon, of course, and, and again, I love the contrast in the images. Uh, the same with Gerald Ford and his very popular and much admired wife, Betty Ford, uh, and then the grimness down here after the uh, 1976 election returns when he, uh, another sort of failed presidency. Uh, obviously, um, uh, Nixon uh, resigns in office, Ford is, fails to be reelected, to be elected, period. And then uh, Jimmy Carter, again, with the optimism versus the failure to be reelected. These are three failed presidencies. And, and along with this came a kind of undermining of pu uh, public confidence in uh, leaders with, uh, in, in particular because of the events of the early to mid 1970s. And here I'm thinking, of the war in Vietnam with the sort of uh, visual uh, reminders of atrocities and other violence in the war and the protests against it, but also um, in the case of the Vietnam, of the Watergate scandal with this extraordinary building there along the Potomac River and how it pulls down the, uh, the, the, the public confidence in the federal government itself and leadership at the very top. One other that I don't have the image of is the CIA, which comes into great question for its uses of assassination attempts uh, throughout the Cold War and a whole series of hearings that are carried out between uh, early 1974 and late 1975 uh, in investigating the CIA and sort of revealing the, the extraordinary secrets of the American operations abroad, which did not uh, sit well with an American public increasingly unhappy with their, with their government. Another example of failure besides cultural, military, and, and political failure would be diplomatic failure. Uh, obviously in Vietnam, that there's diplomacy involved in that. But in particular here, I'm thinking of the, the events in Iran in 1978-79, the seizure of power by the Islamists uh, led by uh, Ruhollah Khomeini and the, the creation of the, the Islamic Re uh, Republic uh, of Iran there in that year in 1979. The seizure of the 52 American hostages and the parading of those hostages before the cameras was something that Americans found especially difficult to swallow, to accept. Uh, and the levels of public resentment and rage about this were really rather extraordinary in the United States in 79 and early 1980. Um, it got even worse when, of course, the, solu the, the attempted solution to this was a, a, a helicopter run rescue operation that failed, killing another couple of handfuls of American, uh, not, not another, but a couple of handfuls of American uh, service personnel, and who then wind up, uh, you know, the, the Iranians wind up instead in this government having the ability to show off America's complete technological failure as well as a sort of political and diplomatic one. At, at least to the cameras of the world. And finally, there is economic failure. And uh, here I'm thinking particularly of the obvious sort of oil crises that unfold uh, in response to the, uh, the Yom Kippur War, the Six Day War between Air, uh, the Arab states around Israel and Israel itself in 1973. Um, that's the first wave of the, the double oil crises. And the second one comes with the Iranian Revolution in 1979. So you have two cases in which. Uh, that's, that's, the, that's the oil companies checking in on me here to make sure I get my prices right. There are two sort of uh, jumps in the price of uh, international prices of petroleum by a factor of four in 73 and then again in 79. So there's this enormous escalation in the cost of energy in the international system, which leads in the United States to terrifically deep economic recession, as we know, the 73, 74, 75 recession. Uh, also to inflation that went with that, this bizarre new phenomenon, stagflation, which was both uh, horrifying and sort of um, undecipherable 
indecipherable for an awful lot of, of uh, serious policymakers as well as academics trying to figure out how do we s solve a problem that doesn't seem to make sense when you have a when you have inflation happening while the while the economy is in deep decline. But even more than that, there was a sense of deindustrialization across the 1970s in the United States. A lot of factories are closing. They're moving out of the northeast into the south, but mostly they're beginning to move overseas. And there was also issues. There were issues of quality involved with this about the loss of industrial jobs in the United States. And the image here I'm thinking of has to do with a couple of the products that come out of you know, that, that I iconic American industry of this era, which, which is the US auto industry, which had long been the model for the entire world. And now instead, they're giving us the Ford Pinto and the AMC Pacer. And, um, I didn't. I didn't put the, vi the, the the image up of the pacer blowing up. You know of the, of the you know because not the, uh, yeah the pinto. I'm sorry the pinto with the gas uh, gas tank in the back, which could be under certain conditions run into and lead to explosions. And I've got a couple of visuals of that, but I, I, my wife always reminds me not to do that because it's her favorite. It was her that was her first car, and so she thinks this is totally unfair the the rap that the pinto gets. So I'm going to try to resist that. But what was going on here for Americans, I think, was a sense of losing one's identity and one's autonomy. Uh, across the 1970s, with all these failures in different vectors or different sectors, really, of the of the American system, there was a sense of losing what made Americans American, what the, of being wealthy, of being powerful, of being people who were competent, of being a nation that was independent and filled with independent individuals who were successful. But there was not just failure in this sort of public sphere, there was also failure in the private sphere. And here I'm thinking of sort of social failure, if you will, in the 1970s. And this is that uh, amidst the, the uh, seeming hedonism of uh, rising drug use, which was really rather extraordinary, the rates of drug use across the 1970s, and uh, the, the sexual revolution that unfolds primarily in the 1970s for most Americans, not in the 1960s, that amidst all this, there were skyrocketing divorce rates uh, and the consequent unraveling of families. And this really got at the business of what holds the nation together. Uh, obviously, w with divorce comes a lot of liberation. There's a lot of people being freed from very unhappy circumstances. I'm not making a simple judgment here about divorce, but, what, but it is as a phenomenon that's society-wide, increasingly acceptable, and, and rapidly moving to where it's uh, one out of every two marriages winding up in divorce. This is a startling experience for Americans who thought that the nuclear family was what Americans revered above all else and what they built everything else around. So there, were, there, there was e enormous anxiety about this, a sense of things coming apart, of unraveling, a, a sense that we might be at the end of a long narrative, which was 200 years old, from 1776 into 1976. And in fact, when you get to the bicentennial year, the prominent Washington journalist, Elizabeth Drew, wrote the following. She was very typical of the kind of uh, sort of mainstream thinking at this time. She, Drew, Drew wrote it this way. She said, it is our bicentennial year. 1976. And we don't seem to know how to celebrate it. Our history began so grandly, and it doesn't seem so grand anymore. That's it for visuals. Now you're going to pay. My experiences of the 1970s included this. I remembered all these things. I remembered a lot of failures, a lot of confusions, a lot of drift. But I also remembered some other things. And this is why I got involved in this research. I remembered a sense of excitement and openness out of the 1970s. And just for full confession, don't bother doing any quick math, but I was 12 uh, in 1970 and 22 in 1980. So this is the, this is the decade in which I came of, of uh, sort of consciousness as a political, social person, I suppose. But what I re recalled was this, this excitement and openness of writing relationships that had gone wrong across a lot of different aspects of society in the United States. Most obviously, the sense of what looked like corruption and failure politically actually meant that we were learning as citizens that power corrupts people, as we had supposedly known but had seemed to have forgotten, and that knowing that and being wise to that would enable the citizens to recreate a better relationship with the nation. So citizens and the nation, that's one set of relationships that I thought were getting right in this era rather than getting wrong. Environmentalists were another group that I remember distinctively from the 70s as people who were concerned with writing the relationship between human beings and the earth. You know, which was clearly by the late 1960s uh, awry. Things were, there were serious problems in environmental terms. Similarly, I remembered evangelicals, particularly evangelical Protestants, but also Roman Catholics in the United States, for whom uh, the business of getting right relationships had to do with humans as individuals and God, getting an individual relationship with the divine that was back on track. 
And finally, another category of relationships that needed to be righted, as I remembered it, were women, who, the women whom, who I knew and lived around and with in the 1970s were people who were changing in fundamental ways the relationships that they had with the men in their lives. So how can the narrative be ending? Or how can our history uh, no longer seem grand precisely at that very moment when women's lives are changing and opening up so dramatically? For me, women was really the, word that was the sort of key category that showed the failure of previous historiography, of previous writing about the history of the 1970s, that this had been essentially a men's history. This was clear to me. So the initial purpose of my research simply was to reconcile, it's not simple, but sounds like it, was to reconcile memory and history, my own memory and history. And, and as we know, of course, history and memory are not the same thing. But we do have to reconcile them in our own lives because we remember things one way about ourselves uh, and, then we have, and about the lives that we've experienced. And then we have to go back, uh, if we're curious about this, and figure out how accurate our perceptions of ourselves at earlier ages are. So what did I find in the course of this research? I found essentially two themes in 1970s America. Uh, one of this was expected and one was emphatically not expected. Uh, the first was a spreading social egalitarianism, a, a growing uh, resistance to inherited hierarchies, a sense of the rightness of people being treated the same, regardless of whatever categories or boxes they could fit in uh, in terms of skin color or sex or disability or sexual orientation or any, anything else. So that's one theme, social egalitarianism. But the other, which is in some tension, but not complete tension with this, was the uh, uh, growing or rising enthusiasm for free market principles, for using the market mechanisms uh, of the economy to also solve social problems and political problems, not just economic problems. Further, as I dug into this research and worked at these two themes, I also began to realize that this was not an American story. It started as an American story, which is a little ironic given that I'm technically somebody who's supposed to do U.S. foreign relations in terms of my previous research. But I started with an American story and quickly realized this was an international story, that world history in the 1970s actually reflected the same two themes that I found in the United States, that American exceptionalism was once again being proven to not be so true. In other words, a large part of my entire career has been sort of wrestling with the questions of American exceptionalism and, and the degree to which the United States is similar to or different from other societies. Um, if it, is, it, is, it, uh, is it unique or are all nations unique or is there such a thing, if all nations are unique, can you have a unique uniqueness? You know, I mean, how, how what's the, how, I mean, just how different is the United States? Or how similar is it to other, to other nations? And in this story, as I began to dig into it, it looked less and less different and more and more similar, which shouldn't be surprising for reasons that I'll make clear. So let me, let me break this down a little for you and tell you a little about each of my two themes and how these unfolded, and then a little about dissenters, people who weren't so happy about how this was going, because there were some of them too. Uh, egalitarianism, the leveling of social hierarchies, uh, is a continuing process that remains quite visible today around us, I think. Uh, in the United States, the most obvious uh, way to see this in the 1970s was the empowerment of, of the female half of the population, of women. And you could see this in the public sphere, you could see it in the private sphere. In the public sphere, this is the era, and, uh, and I'll just sort of suggest several of, of different categories in which you could track this empowerment. One is in education, where you have essentially the rise of full co-education among the elite schools. Uh, in the US military academies, you have the breakdown of old sex distinguishing and discriminating forms of education in the, across the United States. Similarly, you have Title IX, which passes in, in 1972, and which empowers women as athletes, starting as girls as athletes, and ultimately winds up having the effect of bringing us Mia Hamm and 1999 World Cup soccer victories. But along the way, it changes the, 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 the set of assumptions about what it meant to be female from the era in which I grew up in, which there was the whole business about glistening but not sweating, you know, all the sort of anxieties, you know, the six women v basketball rules where you had to keep two women back in the backcourt, you didn't want to run too far. This is this is amazing because all this business about protecting them from over actually because it's all about protect it was the concern was about protecting female reproductive capabilities I mean that they're that they're, these are these are people to be protected that that blows up with Title IX uh, in extraordinary fashion. Uh, you see this in uh, the work world for women, obviously, in terms of the careers that become available to them. If you track numbers of lawyers and doctors, et cetera, from 1970, 1980, those numbers go up very dramatically. You see it in the, in the uh, ending by um, court decisions of the discriminating advertisements, the classified ads back before in the era before Craigslist, when people used to go to classified ads, and you'd see that ads were listed by, by sex, right? Men's jobs 
and, and women's jobs. And that becomes unacceptable legally, smack in the middle of the 1970s, that sort of distinction. You see this in terms of jury duty, women finally getting access to full jury duty, access the privilege of. I suppose you could see it in different ways, depending on how you feel about juries, right? Can we give that one back? No, I, I'm, I'm kidding. It depends on how you think about volunteer work or citizenship, but it's a key piece of citizenship, right? Are you, are you, are you one of the peers of the accused? That's the question. So the same thing can be seen in the world of um, financial credit, of whether or not you can get a loan. I mean, women before the 1970s had great difficulty accessing loans for uh, home mortgages, for cars, uh, for credit cards, for consumer credit cards, all of which are sort of obvious and fundamental elements of whether or not you're going to be financially independent or successful. It's a very dramatic uh, shift going on there in terms of assumptions about women's differentness or sameness to men. More fundamentally, though, for women in the public sphere, gender is coming into question in all kinds of ways that create women's and gender studies programs, that create uh, feminist theory across universities. But in really sort of simplified fashion, you might think of it as going from two boxes, assumptions that there's sort of men in this box and women in this box, to a whole bunch of overlapping weird Venn diagrams in which maleness and femaleness turn out to be not so different, except in some obvious ways, but in other ways there's almost no difference. And, and those charts kind of proliferate across the 1970s as women and men try to figure out what gender really means rather than assuming the things that have been assumed about it before 1970. The same sort of uh, empowerment of women happens in the private sphere of their lives uh, in terms of access to contraception, which the Supreme Court finally grants fully in the Eisenstadt versus Baird decision in 1972. Uh, access to abortion rights in the first uh, trimester, of course, is made legal un under the Roe versus Wade decision of 73. Um, no fault divorce becomes a very fundamental phenomenon across American life. I've mentioned this already. It starts in New York and in California in 1969 and 70. It's the 70s when we see that unfold. This is the era when the word Ms. becomes commonly used, right? Which is, and I'm, I'm still sort of startled that my students have trouble with this. They're like, really? What was the big deal about that? It's like, are we advertising our availability to men or not by uh, the label that comes with us, as, you know, with the comparable term to the, to the term Mr., as opposed to the Miss versus Mrs. distinction that was so standard before that? And, and maybe the most dramatic and most troubling aspect of the empowerment of women was finally getting, in 1975, the passage in, in my state of Nebraska, where I currently live, uh, of the first state laws against marital rape the first declarations of women's, of women's full control of their own bodies, even in the institution of marriage, in which there had been assault and battery charges available before, but there had never been a specific set of laws done by states about marital rape, and that emerges in the mid-1970s. This same empowerment uh, of this social egalitarianism that unfolds for women across the 1970s unfolds for a lot of other people, too. Most obviously, um, gay and lesbian Americans who in 1973, in December of 73, after a very long campaign, are fin finally get the American Psychiatric Association to withdraw homosexuality, to delete it from the long list of mental disorders in the, in the newest uh, di DSM, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, that, that was the, the next edition, which was published in uh, 74, early in 74. This is fundamental. This is where American science is saying, to people who are homosexuals, that you are no longer disordered because of that homosexuality. This is a fundamental shift. It, it doesn't, of course, eliminate homophobia, it doesn't eliminate violence or a discrimination, but it does change the sense of these people's places within American society in really elemental ways. You also see in the 1970s the inclusion of another group of people that had been largely excluded, and this is non-white immigrants. The law is passed under Lyndon Johnson here, 1965, right, the, the key uh, change in the immigration law, the Hart-Celler Act, but the numbers don't really change until the 1970s from the Hart-Celler Act. The immigration numbers, most of that law comes into effect in 68 rather than 65. The numbers don't show up that make the United States and its immigration population increasingly Asian and Latino. Those are, that's going to happen in the 1970s. So America had been previously pretty much a black and white country. Not completely. We know there's tons of good history about, about Latinos, Asians, about Native Americans and others uh, before, 19, before the 1970s. But in terms of big numbers, the real shift in the demographics, that's a 70s story. And this is also true of disabled people who, under the 1975 federal legislation for the first time, uh, get brought into uh, public schooling to the, um, what's the phrase, to the maximum feasible extent. 
into regular classroom education, the idea of including disabled people rather than excluding them and keeping them separately educated. This is a fundamental change in whether they're fully part of the society or, or whether they have sort of a, a different and secondary status. And this logic of inclusion, which you could say really spins from the, the civil rights struggle, of African Americans much earlier, this logic continues on out past humans. It, it goes all the way to animals in the 1970s in really dramatic fashion because the Endangered Species Act of 1973 for the first time grants rights, not individual rights to individual animals, but the right of species to have an ecosystem which is preserved in a healthy enough fashion that they can continue to live and exist within that. So this kind of inclusiveness goes quite far. The same story unfolds across the globe, this sort of uh, egalitarianism, the breaking down of old hierarchies. And it unfolds across the globe in, most obviously, in the breakdown of empires. The 1970s is the, is the death time. Uh, it's the, uh, the, the very end of the great European empires, which had spent uh, 500 years expanding, but also the American empire and the Soviet empire, as, we, as we'll see. All of them are in retreat. The Europeans uh, meet their end in southern Africa with the demise of the Portuguese Empire, the oldest of the European empires in Africa, and the longest standing, the one that had survived the longest into the 1970s. Angola and Mozambique get their independence in 1975. Uh, next comes Rhodesia, next door, which was a British colony that had, its white citizens, of course, had declared their own independence in 65. That is quickly responded to with the uh, campaign of struggle by black Rhodesians that m finally reaches a, a negotiated solution at the Lancaster House Agreements in 1979. Creates the new nation of, uh, as you know, Zimbabwe, right? So this is another, another piece of the old empires dying. And then comes the, the, that sort of logic of rolling off of the historic world stage, all these old hierarchical system, really comes to its final step in South Africa, which I sometimes think of as sort of the radioactive core of historic white supremacy. Uh, here you have the Soweto uprising in 1976, the growth of the black consciousness movement, 19, which is really sort of formally established in 60, 76 and 77, uh, and the last push to freedom that's going to lead to the end of apartheid formally in 1990, the election of Nelson Mandela in 1994, uh, and this is a moment of truly world historical significance. So the European empires are gone, but the American Empire is also in retreat. And the great thing about the end of the Cold War is we get to call it the American Empire now. We don't have to argue about that. We all spent time in grad school trying to argue about it, trying to convince people that the U.S. had an empire. Yes, it was different. It was distinctive. But it's, you know, it's its own large imperial force in the world. Maybe an empire for good. You, know, I mean, you can have different politics about this. But it, it, it has a sort of extraordinary influence of an imperial nature. And that's in retreat in the 70s. Uh, you can see this, obviously, in Vietnam and in Cambodia, the American withdrawals from, from Southeast Asia. But you can see it in the, the Panama Canal treaties, uh, which are terribly important as a symbolic gesture by the Carter administration. Very very contentious at home in the U.S. About, uh, about giving back the Panama Canal and control of it eventually, uh, another decade or two later, to Panamanians themselves. Uh, the same story unfolds of a change in the American imperial presence overseas in Nicaragua, most dramatically with the, the Sandinista Revolution, 1979. Uh, and the throwing out of the Somozas, who were closely allied with all previous U.S. administrations. And you can then see, finally, this uh, withdrawal of the American empire in Iran, and that extraordinary story where the U.S. had been the outside influence of, of, dominant, of a dominant character for some 25 or 27 years before the, the um, uh, Islamists finally take, take control there in 1979. The, the Soviet Empire also is in retreat, and this is something that Americans didn't understand at the time, and they don't fully understand it since, I don't think, that the 70s looked like a sort of boom time for socialism. And the, the, um, the KGB certainly thought it was. They were pumped. If you dropped into KGB meetings in the early 70s, they were like, ooh, the Americans are in retreat, the Europeans are in retreat, we've got good times coming for socialism. You know? And that turns out to not be true. I mean, the bottom line on the Soviets is, yeah, there were some good developments for them in Vietnam and Cambodia. There were some uh, a set of developments in Ethiopia and in Angola early and mid in the mid-1970s that are positive for socialism. But very soon thereafter, things turn south, and I mean south fast. Economic stagnation at home is the single most important aspect of this, and a growing disillusionment among Soviet citizens about the failure of the promises of the Soviet system to uh, provide them with the quality of life that they increasingly knew about coming with, with information and access to, to the West. But there also in the Soviet Union was a two-pronged religiously based rebellion 
on the western and southern edges of the old Soviet empire. And the Soviet empire is sort of a, a, a double empire. There's the internal empire of the USSR, and then there was the external empire of Eastern Europe uh, and the influences there. What's going on is you have in, the, in Europe, you have a, a, a kind of resurgence of Roman Catholicism with the appointment especially, or symbolized by the appointment and also encouraged by the appointment of John Paul II as Pope in 1978, and the rise of the solidarity movement in Poland which is, though it's a labor union, also has deep Roman Catholic influence within it in 1980. Uh, so that late 70s push uh, from the Western side against the Soviets is met by another push from below when the Soviets make the extraordinary choice and ultimately devastating decision to invade Afghanistan in December of 1979 and get themselves involved in a war uh, that they lose eventually over the course of the next nine and a half years against a whole bunch of deeply religious Islamist warriors on the other side, the jihadists who are fighting against them, the Mujahideen as they were known at the time. Uh, so there's a kind of double religiously enthused uh, resistance campaign from the West and from the South against the Soviet Union. And it's in retreat as a result across the late 1970s. What replaces all this at the international level, instead of empires, is a growing enthusiasm for human rights, which is, of course, equality. It's about human equality across all humanity. It's about people having equal rights, which is exactly the same story at home. And the rise of human rights is a very 1970s story. Oh, we historians, we argue about this. Some, there's a lot of enthusiasm for the 40s and the importance of the 40s. And so there's a little mini argument, right? This is how we keep historians employed. They argue about whether, whether it was more important, you know, what goes on at San Francisco at the UN Charter Convention in 45, or whether it's more important what goes on in the Helsinki Accords of 75. But both are important. But in the 70s, it becomes the dominant theme of international debate, dialogue, and increasingly of international relations, is the advance of human rights. You see a whole series of new global uh, non-governmental organizations, NGOs. Oh, that's great to be in the here. I don't need to even say, you guys know what NGOs are. We're in the, we're in the, the public affairs school. But the most dramatic of these would be Amnesty International, which doesn't start in the 70s. It's founded in Britain, of course, earlier in, in 60 and 61. Um, but it, it rises to s significance with the awarding of the Nobel Peace Prize in 1977. 1977, that's the key. Again, it's another dramatic demonstration of the importance of human rights. And, and this isn't a story of perfect human rights, but a rather one of growing political pressure on governments around the globe to acknowledge the principle of human rights for all of their citizens. So that's one theme. That's the social egalitarianism at home and abroad. Then there's my other theme. And this is the one I was a little more surprised to realize the extent of it. I knew there were people enthusiastic about free market principles in the 70s. But I didn't realize quite how effective they were and how prominent uh, this uh, thinking was in shaping public policy in the US as well as around the globe. In the United States, what you see is in the 1970s is a growing disillusionment with the old New Deal order from the 1930s up through the 60s, height, you know, reaching its apex here in the Johnson years of the Great Society. And this disillusionment rides on the backs of the failures that I illuminated here at the beginning, especially the economic failures and political failures of that era. But a sense that, the, that, a, that a, a, an activist federal government managing a national and increasingly globalized economy was not producing a successful economic set of results for its citizens. That feeling was increasingly dominant in the 70s. And this leads to a whole series of innovations, which have to do with, with increasing the visibility of market principles and reducing government uh, management of those. One of these comes in the most elemental way. And you, it, this isn't always thought of in these terms, but it really relates to the free market. And that has to do with who defends the nation in times of crisis. Who provides security for the nation? Literally, who's going to serve in the armed forces when push comes to shove? Under a draft system, as during the Vietnam War, of course, the, everybody is doing it equally. Well, there's some deferments and there's some exceptions, but those are eventually weeded out in the interest of a sort of equal burden of a citizen's right and obligation, more than right, an obligation to help protect its nation, defend it in times of need. Instead, we get the, re the ending of the draft in 1973 and Richard Nixon's replacement of it with the all-volunteer military that we've had ever since, which is terrific in lots of ways. Most obviously, it ends dissent because anybody fighting in the war is there voluntarily. Right? It, but it is also reflects, and Nixon was very clear about this, it reflected the importance, he thought, of the military service lines having to compete for the personnel that they could recruit, that they should be competing in the free market for this. And he's, he, he uses exactly this kind of language in describing it. 
Another element of this kind of advance of free market principles into another sector of American life had to do with the reduction of taxes, the, the whole revolt against taxes, which is most dramatically played out in 1978 in California, Proposition 13, and the defunding of the state government uh, of the Golden State, which they've been dealing with the outcomes ever since. But the idea of a tax reduction and campaigns against taxes Begins in 78, it flows across the entire country. Massachusetts, supposedly very liberal blue state, has a very similar campaign within the next two years. You have a major cut in capital gains taxes on the federal system. And the whole idea of taxes moves increasingly from being a sort of the, the cost of civilization, as the phrase used to be, to instead being something as seen as an undue burden on us by a mooching bunch of government officials who are lazy and who are doing bad things with this money. So how do you, how do you reduce this situation? You don't give them as much, as much revenue. You reduce taxation. You see the same pattern of uh, free market principles in the deregulation of industry. And deregulation is a major theme across the second half of the 1970s. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it takes effect most quickly in the airline industry. And anybody old enough to remember how pleasant it was to fly on airlines before 1975 will know exactly what I mean. Right? Of course, it's a lot cheaper now. I mean, if you factor in inflation, it's much cheaper to fly now. And, and so there's, you know, it's like most uh, public policies, it has its advantages and its disadvantages. Uh, and uh, as I was wedged into this little tiny little regional jet trying to get down here yesterday, I was thinking, yeah, deregulation, it's a great thing. I mean, it's pretty cheap, but it's also, you know, it, it gives people supposedly what they wanted. This is true in the trucking industry, it's true in the communications industry, the breakup of the bell systems, in, all in the 1970s. Eventually, uh, this logic of deregulation is gonna go all the way to the Sunday blue laws. Right, which is one of the best examples of the whole idea of getting the government out of citizens' business. The most recent on this would be Colorado now selling uh, alcohol on Sundays. That was a big one in Colorado that, for the skiing industry. And Utah, which used to have that whole complicated, bizarre, that's a, that's a very judgmental term, complicated, interesting, and distinctive uh, <laughs> set of regulations that they had for, um, for, for they, they, they called them private clubs, you know, to go in and get a drink in Utah, if anybody's ever done this. It was a wonderful. You, every couple years I wind up in Utah and try to figure out how do we do this now? We have to sign things and join a membership? And, you know, and now they just threw it all out. They said, oh, well, we're done with that. We're, now we're going to compete with everybody else. Deregulation is the logic here. But we also saw this in the expansion of gambling in the 1970s. Gambling was something that was supposed to happen in Cuba, before Castro, or overseas, or in Nevada. It was Nevada's bailiwick, and the 1970s changes that. The 70s brings a whole series of shifts in the gambling industry, legalizing it elsewhere, but the big one is Atlantic City. This is the first casino open outside of Nevada, passed by um, a referendum by the, uh, the wisdom of the voters of New Jersey. Um, which we've seen recently once again on play. Uh, I, I don't actually know how they think about gambling in, within the Christie administration. But they, they legalize this, and the Atlantic City builds a, um, uh, its first casino, which opens in 1978. And this is the first step in the big shift that's going to lead eventually to what casino gambling, I think it's in 36 states now, and, uh, and uh, 450 Native American casinos exist at this point. And it's expanding rapidly. It's like, it's oncological. It's cancerous. Um, no, that's a judgment again. Can we cheer for cancer? I don't know. I mean, if you like gambling, it's great. I just, it's more available. You don't have to drive as far to go lose your money or win money or whatever you're going to do. If it was me, it'd be losing money. Uh, so so this, this, this whole phenomenon unfolds steadily across the 70s and on down to today. One last example of the advance of free market principles at home, though, is the expansion of pornography. And pornography really takes off in the early 70s uh, as a kind of culturally, increasingly culturally acceptable phenomenon. This is very, there's even a, a brief period of porno chic between 72 and 74, a sense that, we're, that this is sort of, we're testing out as part of the sexual revolution, sort of how far can we go in letting people do whatever they want to do and purchase whatever they want to purchase in terms of sexual titillation and gratification. But this is maybe most dramatically clear in uh, Deep Throat, the, the film, which uh, comes out in 72 and is, and is viewed by an awful lot of very famous people who are, you know, Jackie Onassis, Aristotle is going to this, I mean, Jackie Onassis uh, is seen going in and out of a theater, and so are all kinds of other prestigious, you know, people you thought were dignified. And in the early 70s, I didn't mean that actually, it's put it, in the early 70s, what was, what was acceptable for dignified people was very much in question. I guess that's really my point. And it's an interesting kind of problem that's going on there. Um, it's going to accelerate with the VCRs, the video cassette recorders, may they rest in peace. They're gone now, but in 75, they were an amazing breakthrough. And of course, what people are mostly watching is pornography, turns out. N nobody's admitting it. 
It's sort of like, I mean, it's like, no, no, that's not me, you know, but it turns out that if you go look at the sales numbers, it was like 80% or some incredible percentage by the end of the 70s was pornography because they, you didn't have to go to theaters. You didn't have to worry about your dignity in public. Now you could just watch it at home, right? So it's a much better, you had to go into the DVD store. See, because we, we weren't streaming it yet, right? But see, streaming solves all these problems. And then you just, it's, it's this very funny kind of problem going on here. But pornography today has become a larger industry than Hollywood movies. Um, or, and it's larger in terms of its to the total money involved than professional football, basketball, and baseball all combined. I mean, pornography, if you're not tapping into it, more power to you. But it's out there, and it's big, and there's serious money involved. I mean, I don't know if it's quite oil money, but it's, it's awesome. Here's a way to think about this deregulation pattern and how it's flowing into all kinds of directions. And there are many more that I outline in the book that I don't, don't go into here in, in detail. Uh, uh, the way I think of it is that this represents the Nevadaization of American society. The Nevadaization. Because it used to be that, that um, people said, you know, what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. Right? You went there and whatever you did over there, and the, 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 the prostitution's legal in, in Nevada since 1971. Note the date again. Uh, you know, quick divorces, quick uh, marriages, whatever you want to do in Vegas, do it. Gambling, all that stuff. But increasingly, I think what we get is instead a sense that what happens in Vegas is going to eventually come everywhere else soon enough. That's the sort of logic of the 1970s. It's about letting people do what they want to do with their own money. It's the logic of libertarianism, not the logic of some sort of traditional social conservatism. It's, it's rather libertarian in that sense. The same thing unfolds across the globe. You won't be surprised at this point in this talk that the same story is not a distinctive, exceptional American story. It's part of a bigger pattern of free market principles in advance. Um, we see this as a kind of advance of capitalism and a retreat of socialism by the later 1970s in particular. This doesn't happen evenly everywhere, right? I mean, world history is too big. World cultures are too diverse. Uh, societies are too complicated to, gar to, to guarantee that they would all, I mean, what it, what it does is sort of guarantee that there will be different time frames for these phenomena. It's not going to be lockstep. But certain patterns are clearly available and visible in this period. Uh, a couple of examples will suffice, I think. Uh, in the southern cone of South America, Chile and Argentina both swing very strongly toward a free market orientation. Chile in the aftermath of the uh, coup led by Augusto Pinochet against the Salvador Allende regime, 1973, that the US was deeply involved with, and the creation of a government that was dominated by a bunch of economists who had been trained at Chicago, University of Chicago, with its famous free market economics orientation. Those people take over Chile in 1973. It's not just the military. Um, and the same is happening in Argentina after the dirty war, as it's sometimes called, against the left from 76 to 83. This story unfolds in the United Kingdom really dramatically because of Margaret Thatcher, who's an extraordinarily powerful and charismatic leader, whether you like her, dislike her, or don't even know who she is, or feel neutrally about her. Not many people feel neutrally, neutrally about Maggie Thatcher, I don't think. But, but she, was, um, she was very powerful at getting through a kind of a delegitimation of the state and a resurrection of the importance of the private sector and of free market incentives from 1979 onwards, from her initial uh, election as, uh, as prime minister. The same story happens in the big prize, too. And the really big prize, of course, is China. And the Chinese story is a 1970s story. Uh, the People's Republic of China had long been enth enthusiastically the most anti-capitalist government in, uh, around the world. But in the 1970s, there are two big steps toward capitalism. Right? The, the first of these comes with the, the opening to the West that reflects the growing split between the Chinese and the Soviets. Right? And that's going to lead to sort of the opening of diplomatic relations, a kind of geopolitical balancing after Richard Nixon's visit in 1972. But the second is the death of Mao himself in 1976 and the death of Zhou Enlai as well, his closest lieutenant. The rise of Deng Xiaoping in replacement of them, which takes the course of about 18 months, and the economic reforms that begin in 1978. Because Deng had uh, realized, uh, along with others around him, that the gap between the Chinese and the West was enormous. And they were determined to shrink that gap, especially economically, technologically. Uh, and, and they were willing to go to take steps down the slippery slope of private property, eventually, in order to do that. It doesn't all happen right in 78. This is a tentative, hesitating process. But it is underway by the end of that year. Um, and by 1986, when I found myself visiting a friend in Kunming in southwestern China, my first uh, visit to China, I, I was stunned by the emphasis at that point of the new slogan, which was, to get rich is glorious. And I thought, where am I? 
<laughs> These people are all, are all excited about getting rich. I mean, the government is enthusiastic about the concept of getting rich being glorious. And this is an amazing shift from something which had been very different under Mao Zedong. One could imagine that Mao was truly revolving in his grave. Uh, within 10 years, by 1989, of course, the Soviet Union would be imploding uh, and the communist bloc was dissolving and China would be well on its way to economic transformation into what it calls today, and this is one of the best, greatest euphemisms of modern history and policy making, I think, socialism with Chinese characteristics, sometimes known as market Leninism, right? Or whatever you want to call it, nutcase capitalism with a communist party sort of in control of it, a communist party, whatever, wh wh whatever. I don't know, maybe here in the LBJ school, somebody probably has a better set of terminologies for this. But they're wrestling with this problem of how do you maintain communist party control and build an increasingly capitalist, free market driven culture. Have there been objections to this trend? These two big themes I'm talking about at home and abroad. Everybody hasn't been, usually is the case, everybody hasn't always been happy. But the dissenters in this case aren't all that powerful yet, at least, although they're pretty articulate about what they object to. And they're very different from each other. There are two main categories of people for whom uh, the twin engines of sort of formal social equality and, and free market principles, um, th th for whom these just don't seem, don't rest easily with their vision of what the world should be. The first dissenting group of the two are conservative religious folks. Conservative religious folks who, from the 1970s onwards, organize in the US in the, in the terms of sort of Christian fundamentalism, particularly Protestant fundamentalism, um, and, but also abroad in terms of Jewish fundamentalism in Israel and Muslim fundamentalism, which is a really problematic term, and I'm putting it in quotations because it's, there are a lot of complicated arguments about why. But, but you could at least think of it as sort of a traditionalist Islam with a political radical edge to it, of which Osama bin Laden is the, is the extreme end of a, of a set of people who don't agree with his particular uh, tactics in, in that pursuit. What these people tended to do, these conservative religious people who emerge in the 70s in organized political fashion for the first time, what these people tend to, uh, to value uh, are, is really traditional hierarchies. They value hierarchies of sex, of age, of class, uh, of uh, deference to established authority and traditions. That's what makes societies healthy for them. They tended to be more concerned with making and sustaining moral citizens, good people, as they understood the goodness, rather than with making simply free individuals. Freedom to them was irrelevant if it came at the cost of corruption of immorality. So they tended to see families, uh, often clans even, depending on which group we're talking about, rather than individuals as the foundations of a good society. They were distrustful of uh, fully free market principles uh, and unrestrained individual freedom. And they would have agreed with the, uh, with the foundational English social conservative, Edmund Burke, who, uh, who really is, is just brilliant in so many ways. But here's Burke's view of this idea of liberty for individuals. Now Burke is usually, usually identified as the great conservative to which all American conservatives are supposed to look backwards. The effect of liberty to individuals, said Burke, the effect of liberty to individuals is that they do what they please. We ought to see what it will please them to do before we risk congratulations. <laughs> That's the question. So conservative Christians instead valued governmental shaping, the use of the government for the shaping of moral behavior in such realms as abortion or pornography or uh, gambling or the sale of alcohol or homosexuality. All of these are realms in which they thought the government should be deeply involved in managing, restraining human behavior because people are sinful from this perspective, right? And you don't just free them up to do whatever they want to do. That will result in chaos. Nonetheless, though, I think in the United States, for the most part, in the 1970s, and really pretty much since, in practical terms, these religious conservatives have tended to accept the kind of rhetorical support that has been offered primarily by the Republican Party. And it has done, accepted this while receiving relatively little in terms of actual changes in government policies or social practices. In other words, there's an awful lot of sort of sound and fury that comes out of the religious right, but not a lot of policy making. There are some exceptions to this. We can all identify a couple here and there. But in general, I think you'll, you'll see a pattern in which they don't get much for the support that they give, which is extraordinary to the Republican Party over the last generation and a half now. The second group of dissenters are totally different. Well, they, they, there actually is some overlap, but not, not a whole lot. They come from a different place, and these are environmentalists. From the 1970s onwards, these people become very prominent. The 70s is a boom time for environmentalism. Uh, and these folks are comfortable 
by contrast with the religious conservatives, these folks are comfortable with the growing social egalitarianism and the, and the growing inclusiveness of American life. But they were deeply opposed to unregulated capitalist economics because they were concerned with something rather different. Uh, they were concerned with what economists call externalities, and again, it's great to be in a place where everybody knows this sort of language, but the costs of economic activity that are not included in the usual calculations of, uh, of sort of, you know, supply and demand and price. Co costs like pollution and global warming, these sort of externalities. This is what environmentalists are focused on. And, and for them, free market economics is a road to, you know, really to hell essentially, eventually, to, to, a, to a rapidly uh, warming climate. This is obviously a story that we're still wrestling with, and environmentalism is very much with us. But the environmentalist aim, at least in principle, was about collective management of collective problems. It's not to say they're socialists. Very few of them are. But they do, to some extent or another, uh, want to engage in something other than unrestrained individual pursuit of profit at any cost. And I think it's possible to see this environmentalist perspective as essentially a conservative position. These folks are, actually, after all, conservationists, right? which is the same root of the same word. To be a conservationist, to conserve, is about preserving or holding on to what already exists. In practice, however, this environmental critique, though potentially radical in its implications, potentially radical, uh, in practice it has tended to get siphoned off, I believe, into individual lifestyle choices more than anything else. You see this, at least in the United States, in terms of like clothing and food and outdoor equipment, uh, sports equipment, it's sort of rather than, than restraining our modern system of consumer capitalism in any truly fundamental way. Uh, not for lack of effort, but that's the way it's played out. There, in other words, what we've seen instead have been the corruptions, or at least the distractions, of things like Patagonia, Starbucks. Whole Foods, you know, a whole set of sort of consumer choices about showing, identifying your politics as healthy and good, politically, you know, appropriate or whatever the right terminology is. Those are all products of the 1970s, by the way. Starbucks, Whole Foods, you know, the, the Patagonia, these things all emerge out of this era. Okay, so what has, so th these dissenters are real, but I think they've had little impact so far. Finally, let me say uh, a little about how the stories come down to the present, because um, this was a history of the 70s. I didn't go out trying to figure out current events. I mean, I'm a kind of old-fashioned historian that way. I, I believe in acknowledging where I stand when I ask questions, knowing that I have subjectivity, but you pursue objectivity. Well, I'm really retrograde. I mean, I actually believe in pursuing objectivity, trying not to insert yourself in the story. Um, and, but I found as I got into this research, the longer I went at it, the more I realized that I was describing what I thought were the themes that were driving a modern American and much of modern world political and social cultural development. Um, this sort of egalitarianism combined with the social egalitarianism combined with this free market emphasis on the economic side. So how has this worked? Well, um, the confusing politics of the United States today are, I think, to a significant extent, extent a, a real direct function of these two themes. Um, on the one hand, this business of social equality and inclusion, you can see it in terms of the words racist, sexist, and increasingly the word homophobe uh, are now fighting words. They're fatal to a public career in this society. Anybody coming out of the School of Public Affairs is highly aware of this. Discrimination and prejudice, of course, have hardly disappeared completely, not at all. But in the public realm, we've seen all kinds of dramatic evidence of a radically shifting terrain toward more egalitarianism. You can't elect a, a half-black president, um, a black president, if you will. That's the American view of it. Uh, or twice, not just once, but twice. You can't have women running the State Department repeatedly. You can't have the leading candidate for president on the horizon being a woman. You can't have gay marriage in 14 states and a third of the American population living in states where they can be legally married as a gay couple uh, and serving openly in the mil U.S. military. You can't have a Supreme Court with six Roman Catholics, three Jews, and no Protestants. Right? You can't have this unless something has changed really dramatically, right? And it sure has. It's changed right smack coming out of the 1970s. American society is significantly more liberal and more equal in social terms. The very fact that most people, if you go out and ask on the street, the religious makeup of the Supreme Court have no idea what you're talking about, and even if you narrow it down and say 630, you know, if you think about the teams, no, that's a joke, but, but you know, if you think of that, those numbers, you, you, people will say, I didn't know that, which tells you something about it, which is that it's significantly less significant than it used to be. People, this, the very fact that the Republican Party, supposedly the party of, of, you know, of narrow-mindedness or something, uh, according to many views, uh, 
nominates, you know, nominates Mitt Romney, right? Which is, you know, I mean, a Mormon is just, that's sort of an unbelievable phenomenon from a historical point of view. So things have changed very dramatically to make this country more liberal and more egalitarian in social terms. On the other hand, the uh, distrust of government remains unfettered. <laughs> it grows every day like another cancer upon the land, I think you could say. Uh, and I can say that in a school of public affairs because people believe in public affairs here, right? So public is, that's, I love that. There's, there's, but there is sort of a reverence for free market principles, for lower taxes, for less regulation of business that has become kind of commonsensical. It's not just the Tea Party. It's much broader than that. The reason that something like the Tea Party can be as successful as it is is it reflects an underlying, underlying kind of discomfort or dis-ease with a lot of aspects of this kind of regulation and taxation. Um, and the result of this has, across the last 35 years has been an increasing inequality of wealth and income. I mean, the numbers on this are very dramatic and very clear and they date directly from the 1970s, that Americans are in increasingly uh, split apart from each other in the distribution. Uh, by econom in economic language, uh, income and wealth are more maldistributed. Not, that's not a judgment, that's a, that's a, a description. Um, the whole idea of the 1% the and the, the business of you know, the, the Occupy Wall Street, that all came after I was deep into this research. So it was kind of amazing to get into this and realize that suddenly people were going to be concerned about growing inequality. The original title of this book was, uh, it, it, now it's called the 1970s, pretty dull, I thought. But this was the editors at Princeton who said, oh, it has to sound like it deals with everything. Okay. It was, originally it was going to be less equal, more equal. Which is, which is the story that I'm describing. But I think American society has thus become more conservative uh, in a certain sense, or at least, and also more unequal in economic terms, uh, just as it has become more liberal in, in social terms. You even have a political party for each team, if you will, for each theme. Uh, both major parties, I think, support both values in this country. Uh, both would, are officially, and I think in the hearts of most of their uh, members, actually believe in equality and believe in non-discrimination on the one hand, believe in market incentives, believe in uh, the private sector and its importance on the other hand. But Democrats tend to be the equality party. Republicans tend to be the free market party. And the result of this has been a kind of hyper-individualism as I see it, uh, in which uh, social inclusiveness now has legitimated the market and its unequal results. In other words, we've had a change in kind of what is natural in, Ameri in common sense in the United States. By removing artificial uh, sort of differences, saying that people of a particular color or people of a particular religion or people of a, of a particular sex can't compete, can't be fully members of this co very competitive capitalist culture, by, by removing that sort of distinction, we have instead allowed what differences remain behind to appear much more natural. That is, the free market, if everybody's allowed to compete successfully, should produce just results. And therefore, whatever distinctions are left should be relatively just according to this kind of vision. And this then is the, is the world that Americans live in today. It's both more equal uh, and less equal than it used to be. Uh, we're both more liberal and we're more conservative than we used to be. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. So it looks like we have some time for questions. Sure, great, great, uh, absolutely. Why don't you all introduce yourselves with your closing question and then Cindy will do a call. On. Absolutely, yes, please go ahead. Mm -hmm. Bob Marquette, I was uh, 40 years old during that period of time. Remember well, look, remember right. fondly. I, I hear what you say from a historical perspective of saying what happened then, but I'm curious as to what your, if you, if you will slip into a subjective role, uh -huh. what are the causes? Why, why did we go uh, in the mm -hmm. 60s, mm -hmm. you know, we, we, uh, we were sort of inside ourselves and conservative, or if you want to call it that, mm -hmm. and all of a sudden, according to you, and mm -hmm. I, I tend to agree with you, all of a sudden we jump up into this egalitarian phase. Mm -hmm. But also, mm -hmm. how did that, how did it go from the United States jump over into the world? What was the driver? Next question. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy, that's a dog. Excellent, excellent. I mean, this is big. So let me try to give the narrow, the, the, the relatively sort of thumbnail sketch vision of that. I mean, uh, I'm going to be a little picky. First of all, I don't think it jumps from the U.S. elsewhere. I think these are, these are sort of parallel phenomena going on in uh, societies that are connected to each other by information flows, by trade flows, by political alliances, et cetera. So I, I'm not sure that, that one is influencing the other more than either way. Uh, you've got a couple of factors here. One is the, that the Cold War uh, lays out a, a sort of political mm, system in the United States in which the language of democracy and freedom is greatly valued 
and then that is revealed to be limited in its actual applications, by, especially by the black freedom struggle in the South, which is the key driver, as I see it, of most of the sort of egalitarian logic that, that sort of filters out into the broader culture in the course of the late 1960s and really takes effect in the 70s. And that's, that filtering happens with the breakdown uh, along the lines that I suggested with my videos, my, my visuals at the beginning, with the war in Vietnam, particularly the disillusionment with authority that comes with that, with the Watergate scandal. The sense that, that, that this promise of freedom and democracy that we were raised to believe in in this country, especially if you were in my generation as a child of the baby boom, we were raised to believe that. And then when that turns out to be, you know, that the emperor, if not having no clothes, just barely has underwear or whatever the right analogy is, you know, it turns out that, that that's not completely true. There was a great sense of wanting to engage with that, to, to needing to overcome that somehow. So I feel like that's a good part of the, of the driver comes from that set. But then, but, it, but obviously the economic piece is the dominant one for, for completely ra uh, erasing the assumption of so many generations of Americans through earlier recessions and earlier downturns that their children would have better opportunities than they did. And that, that story, that American economic story, despite, all, excuse me, a lot of good revisionist history and uh, demonstrations that there have been longer downturns than we thought in the 1890s and 1870s and various traumas and, you know, nonetheless, that upward story is very traceable. I mean, there's no question about the economic growth of the country and the extraordinary opportunities. The middle class culture that is developed after World War II is extraordinary in its reach. And so when that grinds to, not a halt exactly in the 70s, but it grinds to something like a very slow crawl, and then the average uh, households, the household's annual incomes begin to drop from the early 70s up into the mid 90s. That seems like a reversal of everything that the United States is supposed to the promise to its people. And that, and that raises, that kind of means anything is fair game now in terms of rethinking where we go. Great question. I, I wish I could do better justice to it. Go ahead. Yeah. Oh yeah. Well, you know, <laughs> the very this is great because I, here's my, my my visual for this as a historian. I think of the past as a as a tapestry that is sewn together with no there's no there's no holes in it. It's a great big unified whole. And anytime a historian drops in, and I think of it as sort of moving from left to right because I'm not Chinese or I don't know what the right term. I mean, in terms of how I read, I go this way. So I think of it chronologically going this way, and I think of it as being that anywhere you enter the past to begin a story, to begin a history, you're taking a, a surgical tool and you're carving into it. So you are rending the garment. I mean, you're doing something wrong right there because you're already saying this is where the important stuff begins. You're saying that even if you say in the first few sentences like some of us do, despite the importance of the da 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 da, you know. You're already artificially calling attention to this one line. So it's, you, it's I, I guess I'd like to think of it instead as a spotlight saying, you know, we're looking at this period because it's particularly important. But there's no magic to zeros, right? If we lived in a, in a, con in a country with a mathematical system with a base of eight instead of 10, you know, I'd be talking about, I don't know, 72 to 80 or I don't know, 70. It'd be totally different, right? So in fact, my story is primarily about 1973 to 79. It's sort of a six year story, really, that happens to fall all in the 70s, so I can kind of get away with it. And it's sort of a shorthand. So, this, so the, your question is an excellent one. And, that is, and the answer is absolutely. These processes are going to continue to unfold in the 80s, particularly the free market story. I mean, Reagan is going to surf that wave right into office. He's going to be a cheerleader for it. He's going to be a public policymaker for it. But he's not the creator of it in any way. He's just another particularly important and charismatic uh, leader you know, in that story. And I think it's very much the story we're still with today. But I also think the egalitarianism is vivid. And I think Ronald Reagan's another example of this. I mean, you know, he's, he, he spent all that time in Hollywood. He didn't hate gay people. I mean, you know, he knew tons of people who were homosexuals. And, and, and for him, I think if he were still alive, I doubt he'd have much trouble. Right now. Barry Goldwater certainly would have no trouble at all, as he made clear before the end of his life, no trouble at all with the idea of gay marriage or, or whatever else on the egalitarianism side. So I think these stories continue to roll on. And I think you could also you could ask the same question about the 60s. Right? Doesn't much of the energy of what I'm talking about really start in the 60s? And I think the answer would be yes, but. <laughs> I'd say, yeah, it starts there. In some ways, you can see it visible. But where you see it really gain speed comes with the events of the 70s. Yeah. Go ahead. Great. But uh, hearing you speak, I, um, the documentary, the BBC documentary, The Century of Self, comes to 
to mind. Um, mm. it, it kind of it approaches uh, a lot of these issues from a psychological uh, perspective. Mm -hmm. I'm sure mm -hmm. you've seen that. Uh, I, uh -huh. It does. It, tongue and groove is exactly the right image. It fits perfectly. I haven't seen that particular video, but the, the, there's a magazine that be, gets published starting in 1974 called Self. It's the perfect emblem of this. This is when People Magazine be, grows into that monstrosity that has seized the grocery checkout line, right? Yeah, that emphasis on individuals and their own little psychodramas. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, yeah, and, and I think the, 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 Tom Wolfe, the journalist, famously called this the, the me decade, which I think in some ways is more applicable to the 80s, actually. But it's, you know, anytime you break these lines at 70 or 80, you're kind of artificially carving things up. We shouldn't. But it is true that there, and I, I try to lay this out in the book in ways I didn't talk about today, it, it is true that for an awful lot of Americans, the disillusionment that came out of that early visual part of what I talked about today, that disillusionment leads to a turning inward, to a focus on running, <laughs> to a focus on yoga, to a focus on taking care of your personal body, of eating the right foods, all of which may be very healthy and great for the culture, but running takes off, right? I mean, in 1972, I'm sorry, I'm really, this is a too good an opportunity, that New York uh, Marathon has like, um, I don't know, like 7,000 uh, entrants, and by 1980, it's got, I don't know, 100,000 or some unbelievable number, just, whoo, it just creates, uh, basically those people in Oregon, Nike, those people, they make, Wads of money in the 70s, because Nike starts in 1972. You know, the waffle iron and the glue in the waffle iron. I had one of those pairs of shoes. Bought it in 76. The first waffle iron came out and felt it lasted me 11 days. I remember thinking, <laughs> built in obsolescence. I was totally unimpressed. <laughs> but, but yes, there, there was that sense for a lot of people of turning inwards, working on their own issues, because if the public sphere is so corrupted, if it doesn't work anymore, the least I can do is create a decent life for myself, be a good person in my family. I'm trying to put the best spin on this. Some people see it as selfish, but I think you can see it as look, working on self-actualization, as the language often was at the time. Seeking to do a higher quality, and we still do that. Although, this is cool, because being in the School of Public Affairs, you guys, by definition, are here because you believe in doing more than that. But you're also, like all of us, engaged in trying to build a better individual life, too, a higher quality of what you have to offer. So go ahead. Yeah, yeah I, I, I like your point about kind of this loss of belief in the 70s. And I, I totally agree with you, sort of your point that's been made about hyper-individualism. And it seems to me that something else is going on that's very important that perhaps is in your book, but that I didn't hear about. And that is what's going on in the media. And uh, mm -hmm. this may sound conspiratorial, but it's not. But after Watergate, uh, CBS, Time, so the, the American media uh, publishers and, and executives realize that it makes no longer sense to themselves be the focus of the news or of controversy. They feel like they've been mm -hmm. burned, that Watergate was a very dangerous yeah. position to be in. Mm -hmm. At the same time, you have these increasing economic imperatives for the news business and for mm -hmm. the media and, of course, the burgeoning uh, television right. nationally and worldwide. Mm -hmm. What you have is you have, instead of having a single sense of self as Americans, you have then this, um, you have a proliferation of these shells of your, you know, your self-actualization, but no longer is there any sort of pretense about, well, this is actually what we can say the effect of public policy is. This is how we can judge this politician. This is how we can judge this party. In fact, as you, everybody is well aware of studies public policy, you have this kind of bogus objectivity of this is what he said, right. she right. said, right. this is what they said, right. this is what their defenders right. said. And right. so no longer do you have, and you yeah. have, with that, you have, mm -hmm. a, you have a plummeting in the amount of investigative journalism. Mm -hmm. So you have this kind of lack then of, and we know of journalism today how it is, and so you have this kind of this, all these voices, and they're all saying the same, kind yeah, of the same, yeah, yeah okay, yeah, that's fine, yeah. that's fine, that's fine. Yeah. And meanwhile, they're all tethered to you know, economics and advertising and so mm -hmm. forth. And so you have this kind of, so you, yeah. so you do have this loss of, of belief in Americans and this, mm -hmm. and this proliferation of other ones, and no longer is there kind of any, mm -hmm. There's no arbitrary. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Not the state and not, not the media. Right, not Walter Cronkite to do it for us. Yeah, no, this is nice. This is really mm -hmm. nicely put. I, I would agree with you. Um, what's ironic about it, of course, is the 70s is also the era because of the Watergate scandal. 
that the investigative journalist reaches his or her highest point in sort of, you know, admired status. Briefly, there's a kind of apex there, right, where thanks to Dustin Hoffman and Robert Redford, we all loved, <laughs> grew to love investigative journalists, right? And, but the reality you're suggesting is a structural shift that's going underneath that, away from that. And I think that's true. I think you can also see this in the growth of cable television, which emerges out of the late 70s, right? I mean, ESPN is, first goes online in 19... CNN. C CNN, sorry. CNN in 1980. ESPN is later, I'm sorry. CNN, 1980. And you have this quick sort of acceleration of a diversity of points of view and a sort of spreading out and a loss of, uh, of having the same facts in common which is sometimes the way we talk about it today. Used to, used to, we used to have the same facts, but you could have your own opinion about it. Nowadays, everybody gets their own facts, you know, which is an amazing thing about American life. I mean, except if you're outside the U.S., it's like, these people are nuts. I mean, they're really, truly talking past each other. Yeah, this is great. I appreciate that very much. Go ahead, Jeremy. So, so Tim, this, this yeah. was wonderful. And you, you, you do such a wonderful job of bringing the, the spirit and texture of it out. Um, but I wonder if, if I could just play devil's advocate for a second. But, you know, I've but, other, <laughs> the big but. Yes. What, 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 what's your response to someone who says, well, you know, all this stuff is going on, and mm -hmm. this is interesting and fascinating, mm -hmm. but maybe the, you know, the three issues that might matter the most to a lot of people, there seems to be um, a lot of continuity pre-1970s and post-1970s, right? So one would be that you have this you know, great array of civil rights legislation in the 1960s. By the end mm -hmm. of the 60s, as people have written about yourself, including mm -hmm. the Civil mm -hmm. Rights Coalition cracks up. And uh, there really isn't any great civil rights legislation after that. And by most measures, America gets more equal economically mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and in terms of, of a lot of socioeconomic measures through the late 1960s. And then that stops. And in fact, it goes in the other direction, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. uh, so that'd be one issue, in inequality, civil rights. Yeah. Yeah. Second, in terms of American foreign policy, right? Mm -hmm. uh, through the 1960s, the United States is able to, in, in many parts of the world, until the Vietnam War, uh, produce a lot of what, are, at least at the time, looked like positive results. Um, and that mm -hmm. after this period, um, maybe we're more conscious of the failures, mm -hmm. but the failures mm -hmm. seem to dominate uh, the story, right? And then the third, uh, right, the uh, third uh, being uh -huh. um, that for all the, all the discussion of freedom and individual uh, liberty, mm -hmm. right, mm -hmm. by a lot of measures, um, Americans, you know, the, the period of growth of freedom is through the late 60s, and by after, after that it looks, it looks different if you look at uh, choices of where to live that people have, right, the suburbanization and, ways in mm -hmm. which, as, mm -hmm. as you know, this mm -hmm. large mm -hmm. literature argues, mm -hmm. people without certain means and mm -hmm. those who don't meet certain characteristics don't get to live in, in certain areas and get stuck in, in different areas instead, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, to what extent yeah. are those dynamics things that yeah. start yeah. In, the, in the 60s, really, as right. the literature used to argue before your wonderful right. 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 and really uh -huh. carry uh -huh. over through uh -huh. this period in uh -huh. spite of all these, uh -huh. these important cultural changes you point to? I don't know. Over empowered professors get three questions. This isn't fair. This is, this is good. The first and third are closely related, and I guess my simple answer to those this is very challenging, and we could spend a few hours on this. We probably will later. But, uh, but the, 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 the first and third are connected on the issue of whether poverty and socioeconomic class is as racially coded as it used to be. And there's interesting arguments about this, but I think the answer is, is absolutely less racially coded than it used to be. Absol I mean, what you see is a serious growth of a black middle class across the 60s on to the present. Is it large enough? No, no, I mean, it's fantastically not. And we still have all kinds of racial coding in that. But, but I think there is a significant change there, my own view of it is. I would say, in agreement, though, with that emphasis, I tend to draw a distinction in the book between the public sec sphere and the private sphere, that in public life in the United States, that there's been a great deal more desegregation and sort of intermingling by sex, by race, by religion, all these ways, much more so than in private life. Private life is slower than that. There's no question about that, but I think that'll come. I think on your second point of uh, the America's relationship with the world, you know, are we more, was the U.S. more successful before the 70s and less successful after? I, I guess I'm just not sure. That's a big, that's a big generalization. I'm not sure I'd agree with the, the U.S. gets away with a lot more before the 70s. Uh, whether it's successful, I guess in that sense, maybe. But, you know, since then there's been an awful lot of successes too. I guess I tend to see, you know, that the first Gulf Wars and the end of the Soviet Union or, and, the, and the corruption, I mean the liberation of China from socialism or whatever you want to call it. Uh, these are all amazing stories of success for capitalists like you and me, I guess would be the way to put it. Yeah, yeah. That's too short an answer. No, no, thank you, thank you. Okay, go ahead. Yeah. Oh, great. Uh -huh. um, I am curious about uh, the 1970s as the moment when empire sort of gave way to human rights and yeah. free market capitalism. And I'm, I'm thinking particularly about Argentina and Chile, which you mentioned. I don't know 
Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. And uh, it's a sort of new version, like it's hybridized sort of mm. mix between the empire and the free market capitalism, which you know the U.S. and China mm-hmm. are more public in. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'm guessing, curious, uh, how you see that, that uh, playing out over time, if there are still traces of like U.S. empire, so it's not necessarily falling away completely. Yeah. Uh, yeah. How yeah. free market capitalism sort of makes empire this more sort of insidious kind of uh, element. More insidious or empowering. I mean, depending on one's politics. Either way, yeah, no, I think this is nice because I I made it sound a little, I'm being too quick here in my description, that empire sort of dies in the 70s. It doesn't, and you're absolutely right to point this out. It's going to change form, but, you know, and it's possible to see empire in descriptive terms, uh, the American, the Soviet, the the Russian version, as a sort of continual effort by large national entities to influence, ideally dominate, control, ideally even dominate large sectors of other parts of the world, whether, you know, through economic cultural means or whether through military. And, and there's a lot of different ways to think about empire, but certainly you're right in describing it as something that's atrophying, but not dying completely. And that, and that sort of continues to burble along. And boy, do they know this in, in Latin America better than anywhere else, right, where that struggle sort of continues to sort out how much of the American dominate, how much of the system they had that was American dominated they want to keep? And how much do they want to keep without US domination? Is it then a better version if, if Pinochet's successors run capital, a free market, essentially free market system in Chile? Is that better? I think that's an open question. Yeah, yeah. So you, thank you for reminding me. That's a story that's ongoing. That's the, the yeah. How, yeah. Are we doing our time? Just one okay. Yeah, okay. Sure, yeah, yeah. I'm glutton for punishment. Yeah. Thank you. And one of the interesting things you talked about is this trust of leadership and the sort mm-hmm. of general breakdown of the trust we have in yeah. our leaders. But yeah. I just finished reading Christian Carroll's Strange Rebels book, mm-hmm. and he focuses mm-hmm. the sort of conservative revolution on leadership mm-hmm. and on these like, strong leaders throughout yeah. the world that sort of make this change and yeah. create or, or dynamize a lot of the sentiment. So how do you manage yeah. this distrust of leadership with the rise of leadership class that goes on for 20, 30 years? Yeah, his book doesn't talk about the U.S. hardly at all, if I'm right. I mean, it's really, it's a sort of a world, it, it, as I recall, it's focused on, on Thatcher, Mao, John, John Paul II, two others. The Ayatollah. Some, I guess, yeah. So, so there are all areas in which the U.S. gets involved. Um, but but and I, this, is a, this is an interesting question um, because, you know, it's, it's possible to distrust leadership and also be enamored by charismatic leaders, right? I mean... And there's no better demonstration of this than Protestant evangelicals in this country. Uh, and I, I, this is not, uh, I'm not, I'm making no judgment about this, but these are people who really are committed to individuals' relationships with the divine, not to hierarchy between here and the divine. But if you look at evangelical churches, they are dominated by charismatic, and I mean that in a positive sense, by leaders who are really attractive, you know, per, in personality. So, so I think that's a tension, and I think it, it's a, at the tension that we all have about you know, wanting to be part of something bigger and following leadership that we trust and admire and always sort of, I don't know, filtering through the tea leaves, hoping that we can find a presidential candidate that we could actually be excited about or what, you know, or a governor or whatever, you know. But, but at the same time, knowing that really, if you're really serious about understanding how power works, the last thing in the world you do is ever trust anybody with power. I mean, you just don't, that, what is it Reagan said about I, I love being able to quote Ronald Reagan, and people think I'm eh, pro Reagan. No, it, but, but about the, so the negotiations with the Soviets over nuclear weapons, right? Trust but verify, you know, which is that in power, you know, it's gonna it messes people up. So I, I mean, I'm not bullish on. I mean, I think the book is interesting because it points out the importance of 1979 and and charismatic leaders in those different roles. But I think on each one of those, you can pull them apart and you can say, look, John Paul II is important, but he's also riding a wave of of resurgence within the Roman Catholic Church that predates his archbishopship in uh, Krakow, and it predates much less his getting to Rome. You can do the same thing with the Chinese. The Deng Xiaoping is very much a part of a group of reformers, and being Deng centered is very American. Cent- that's a nice little pun, actually. Never mind. But but, but being very but we, that's an American view of, of kind of you know wanting leaders that we can follow. You know that's it's kind of with Self Magazine. It's with this business of you know important people, and I think we can be sympathetic to that. But boy, we need to be skeptical about it. You know, and that's what the civil rights movement taught us was sort of it's not about Martin Luther King Jr. It's about you know you pursue justice, you build it at the local level, whatever you're going to do. I mean, even if you're doing global leadership, you do it at you know you start local and work your way up. 
Well, I know Tim, he'll entertain one or two more questions down here up front if there are a couple lingering, but I think we should probably call okay. it quits and most importantly okay. say thanks a million for a fascinating talk. Thank you. Thank you.